I'm very pleased today to be joined by James Moore, a former member of the Canadian Parliament, a good friend of mine. We're going to talk about the bilateral relationship. We're going to talk about Canadian politics, and we're going to talk about our shared North American history, our culture, the differences in the country, and what binds us together. James, welcome. Good to be with you, Steve. Um, You live in the great city of Vancouver, which I think is the most beautiful city on the on the North American continent. Uh, you've served as a senior minister in the in the Canadian government, in government, as a member of parliament. This is a mostly American audience, um, but not universally. Talk about Canada. What makes Canada unique and special amongst the English speaking countries? It wasn't it supposed to work. Probably the fact that it's not an English speaking country, but is viewed by the other English speaking countries as such because of its Commonwealth affiliation. Canada as a country is not supposed to work. You are the second largest country in size, the 37th largest in population. Uh, we're born out of divisions, Indigenous Canadians versus the English versus French. We have ling linguistic barriers across the country. So you have uh, this massive continental footprint with a thin population, 80% of whom live within a two-hour border uh, with the United States. So our relations with the United States are enormously economically and culturally uh, important. We've had you know, two referendums on Quebec sovereignty and separation. Of course, we've gone through world wars. We've gone through all kinds of crises, political ones as well, scandals as bad as the worst of the, that Americans have ever seen. So we've had a lot of stresses and, and, and stress tests on the fact of Canada, and yet we've endured. Um, you know, there's a there's a parallel narrative there with the United States as well. But, it, but in Canada, uh, you know, it, it is true. We're less jingoistic. So we expect more practicality from government ideology is and, and we don't dump as much of our identity and sense of self-worth, sense of community into government, because for where I am in Vancouver, Ottawa is a very far off place. It's not wouldn't be very different from somebody in Bend, Oregon, looking at Washington, D.C. and saying, well, what happens there doesn't really matter. Um, but there's a dissociation here that and a lot of our identity and sense of purpose and sense of community and sense of justice is not invested in politics as much, it seems to me, as a degree it is in the United States. We're a proud country. We, you know, we we think that we're more important in the world than we are. I think part of that is because we get sort of drawn into the narrative and the language and the vocabulary of American politics and and all that. Being on the right side of history and some of the big fights, Second World War, Cold War, the war against terrorism, I mean, that gives us a sense of righteousness that I think is earned, but but I think can sometimes be overstated in our posture around the world. You see that with Justin Trudeau getting over skis a little bit and being a bit a little bit, little bit luxury, certainly from the left. Um, but we were a country that also has our challenges, right? I mean, the urbanization of Canada, you know, the cost of living in Canada is, is sky high. Vancouver is one of the most expensive cities in the world. We have tensions, indigenous and non. We have, you know, you know, more Canada is a population of 40 million. Last year alone, we, we drew in. Now there was a there was a backlog because of COVID, but we had a million new Canadians were became Canadian citizens last year. So there's those tensions of, of new Canadians coming in economic social cultural so we're, we're a country that is that is struggling fighting doing well um, but we have our challenges what is the role of the united states with regard to this issue given the historic ties the closeness of the military alliance and canada standing as a five eyes partner and a nato member so I was a member of parliament. I, I remember I was home on 9-11 when that happened. And th there was a spook that happened in Canada, not just on the substance of that day and the, and the policy and the, and the long-term fallout of that event. But from that moment forward, all Canadians were became very anxious, particularly those of us in government, about any attack on the United States that was born in Canada. A sleeper cell, uh, an errant ne'er-do-well who crossed the border, who demonstrated that if in some way that the Canada-U.S. border was ineffective in protecting Americans from American interests and from outside threats. So that threat and, and any incoherence, incompetence, 
uh, in the Canadian side of the border that leads to the loss of American life in a time of economic nationalism, nationalism broadly, sort of, you know, ethnic nationalism and, you know, in the blood and soil parts of the Trump movement, any opportunity to sort of push away and to block the Canada-US relationship and to close that border would be devastating for Canada. About one in five Canadian jobs is dependent on trade with the United States. It's the most prosperous relationship in the history of the world. We do about two thirds of a, of a trillion dollars in, in two way trade every year. I mean, it's one of the most successful, it is the most successful economic partnership in the history of the world. And if you had any kind of attack in Canada, that was a consequence of Canadian government incompetence that led to a death of an American. The, the, the ability to weaponize that and to use that to, to thicken the border between Canada and the United States would be economically detrimental to both of us, but particularly for Canada. So any so these incidents on their own are problematic, but in terms of what it means for the broader relationship and the security that we can feel as partners and neighbors, uh, that that would have a very long and devastating consequence if it went if it went badly. Is Justin Trudeau in his last term? Probably, uh, whether he knows it or not. Uh, you know, the, the history of Canadian prime ministers, we, we, we've had, you know, lots of prime ministers in Canadian history, but he is deep on the back nine um, of his time as prime minister. He was elected with a majority in 2015, minority government in 2019, a minority government again in 2021 when he thought he would win because the Conservative Party was disorganized and, and not quite prepared for that campaign. In politics, you, you know, as you know, you, you start with a lot of friends and you tend to lose them over time. The, the degree to which that slope is, is straight south depends on your behavior and, and the way in which you carry yourself. He's lost a lot of friends pretty fast. Um, you know, he is deeply unpopular. He's probably the most unpopular. I would say his unpopularity in Canada now would probably be comparable to the unpopularity of uh, George W. Bush in the towards the end of his campaign or at the end of his time in his in his second mandate. It's almost that hot. There's not an issue like Iraq. There's not an issue like uh, in, in like that in Canada. That's that, but it just people are just tired of him. Tired of being lectured. Tired of the elitism. They look around and they see you know uh, divisions with India, divisions with China, tensions with the United States. Whether it's with President Trump over all of, you know those tensions, or if it's even with President Biden over the Inflation Reduction Act and what that means for Canada. We see you know tensions with Europe. You see housing prices going up, cost of gas going up, like everything just seems to be not going right. And in Canada, we have a parliamentary system, but we have a presidential style politics. So so it is, as you phrased it, it's the Trudeau government. It'll be the you know, Pierre Polyev alternative. It'll be that's how we phrase our politics. It's not quite conservative liberal, even though people sort of identify in camps. But, you know, the candle that burns the brightest burns the fastest. And he's a, he's a supernova in terms of his personality. You you take in Justin Trudeau for about five minutes and you kind of immediately have an opinion of the guy. You don't you don't oscillate. You lock in with you like what you see. You don't like what you see. And the like what you see crowd is getting smaller over time as they as they're presented with disappointment after disappointment relative to the hype and expectation of him becoming prime minister. Um, you know, he was he was hot stuff. He was a winner. He was a good looking guy, well spoken and of a new generation. And then as we've sort of seen, you know, in your third mandate, you get now he's more than halfway now through his third mandate as prime minister. You kind of look around, you go, wow, you talk about an overhyped stock. And, and I, that's just kind of a natural reflex that a lot of swing voters are having about him. Talk about Pierre Polyev. Who is he? Is it fair yeah. for him to be labeled as Canadian Trump the way that uh, Justin Trudeau and the uh, party leadership is is doing? So people that I know who are very close to Justin Trudeau said that if he was going to run for a fourth term and if he's going to be successful in that effort to try to hold on to power, three things had to happen. Number one, Pierre Polyev, when he took over the Conservative Party last year, he would have to crash and burn on the runway. That hasn't happened. When he took over leader, the leader of the Conservative Party, the Conservatives are about five points down. They're now 15 points up. Second is they needed to have the economy have a, have a turnaround and not go into recession. Well, we had a contraction in the second quarter of this year. This, there's every reason to believe we're, we're in a technical recession right now, and it's not likely going to get better before year's end. So that's up. The third thing that the Liberals need and Justin Trudeau needs for him to want to run again is that Donald Trump has to come back. 
And Donald Trump has to come back with gusto and with, you know, the belligerent crazy and the worst iterations of Donald Trump, uh, which is, I can tell you, is toxic in Canada. Like it is, you know, you talk about his unpopularity in Canada. Donald Trump's popularity is probably, you know, 95 to 5 net negative. Like it is, he is as toxic in Canada as, as it can be. And to try to tie Pierre Polyev to Donald Trump is the last sort of thing that, that Justin Trudeau has. And that, and that that dog is not going to hunt. It is just not there. Canadian conservatism has always been very different from American one. It's just like British Tories, Canadian conservatives, American Republicans. It's very different, right? We we align, I suppose, on a lot of broad themes about trust in the private sector, belief in free markets, the, the responsibility of families to take care of each other, the value and virtue of community is the backbone of quality of life and the importance of, of protecting uh, what it is that's most sacred to us, which is our family and our kids and our schools and our neighborhoods. Like that, that, that ethos is all there. Strong national security, strong, strong uh, justice policies. But that's, but when it comes down to the technical stuff, like Pierre Polyev he is a perfectly bilingual a francophile canadian which is say he's he's anglophone but he's french speaking from outside of the province of quebec he is pro-choice pro-gay marriage doesn't care who sleeps with who believes in lower taxes smaller government responsible uh, responsible use of government power in a limited consequence now that that is not a donald trump republican like he is pierre is clearly he's out there saying that he will march in pride parades he has he has been out there he the deputy leader the deputy leader of the conservative party of canada uh, is a woman named Melissa Lansman, who is a married lesbian from down from Toronto. That's the deputy leader of the party. I don't think he would get that in a Marjorie Taylor Green party. I don't think he would get that, you know, in a, in a Rand Paul party. But in Canada, it's very different. I mean, I I, I was a conservative cabinet minister for Prime, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who's seen as probably the most small C conservative prime minister in Canadian history. And I voted in favor of gay marriage in 2005 you know, three years before Barack Obama ran for president saying he would never vote for gay marriage. So that's the, the, the tilt of left, right in Canada is very different than is the United States. So Donald Trump is toxic. Liberals will try to make Pierre Polyev the alternative prime minister to Canada. They'll try to make him Donald Trump light, but it's, it's just very different. He doesn't speak like Trump. He doesn't talk like Trump. He Pierre speaks in a very aspirational terms about empowering families, growing the economy. It's a very positive message. I know Make America Great Again was positive for some people who heard it a certain way, but it was dog whistle for a lot of other people. There's none of that with Pierre. He's a, he's a straight shooting. If, if you wanted an apples to apples comparison to what you've seen in contemporary American politics, I would say he would be kind of a, a Canadian version of sort of peak Rand Paul, pre-speaker Rand Paul, on the rise, energetic, you know, in shape. You know, reaching out to shake hands of the voters, sort of jogging in the parade, enthusiastic to talk about public policy, smart guy. That's that's what Pierre Polyev is. Um, when you when you think about this moment, do you think that Canada has a higher immunity, a higher tolerance to the type of demagoguery and populism we've seen break out in the United States that? It has a cultural prophylactic, if you if you will, that armors it a bit more. Yes, but it's fragile. It's there to be, it's there to be exploited because the tensions do exist. So the number one issue in Canada, and it's been the case for about six months now, is the rising cost of housing. Like the cost of owning a home in Canada is is almost completely out of reach for most Canadians. Like it's 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 ludicrous and for a whole bunch of reasons, but it is what it is. So you have a million new Canadians on a population base of 40 million and million new Canadians come into the country in one year. So you have this massive demand for housing. And so that's ripe for exploitation. You have more people looking for housing and houses aren't being built. So you have Canadians who have been here for generations not being able to buy homes. The, the, the link and for exploitation for, for hardline populism is right there, but nobody picks up the bat and swings it. It just, it just isn't done. It's not that somebody won't, might not do it, but it just isn't done. Perhaps because Canada is so diverse now that uh, to do that would be sort of politically suicide because you know, other, other Canadians, whether you're Chinese, Canadian, Japanese, South Asian, Filipino, whatever, that you would say, well, if if that, if the majority is going to go after that minority, we could be next. And there's kind of the solidarity of people who are new to Canada against the exploitation of other new Canadians. So, so that that's kind of a, a pressure valve against it. But in some ways, it also blocks off important conversations about that stress that doesn't exist. You should know as well that since Stephen Harper was defeated in 2015, there was a conservative leadership race in 2018 or 2017 
campaign. There was a second conservative leadership race going into the 21 campaign. And then there was the conservative leadership race that resulted in Pierre Polyev. Those three leadership races combined. There were, I would say, about 30 or 32 people ran for the leaders of the Conservative Party of Canada. Not one out of 30 plus people who ran in those three cycles. Not one person ran for the leader saying, if you like Donald Trump, you'll love me. And, and 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 parroted Donald Trump. Not one person did that. It is that does not fly in Canada. The us against them, banning Muslims, making fun of a disabled reporter, ostracizing the other, talking down, you know, belittling stuff. That that does not fly in Canada. There's no interest in that, even within a diminished conservative party on its back legs, deep in the woods, in opposition against a, a liberal majority government and, and Justin Trudeau on the march. Even when a party is shrunken and broken and depressed and trying to find its soul, even in that rubric, a guy like Donald Trump had no purchase in the conservative party. Nobody even tried to parrot him because it was just there was no interest in it. So to a lot of people who try to make Pierre that guy, it's not going to work. People who try to dial up that politics in Canada, it's not going to work. There's a people's party that still exists that has tried now for two elections to elect people kind of on a soft Trump mandate, sort of more, more of a libertarian populism type thing of Maxime Bernier as the leader. You know, he has failed now, I think, four times, five times in a row to get a seat. There's no interest in that stuff in Canada. Why? I think it's the, uh, the diversity of Canada is there. I think there's a temperament in Canada. Um, the, and also in Canada, like in the United States, I mean, as you, you know this very well, right, there's you have three co-equal branches of government. Washington, D.C., the U.S. Capitol building sits symbolically in the physical center of Washington, D.C., as a, as a demonstration that the Article One of the Constitution is Congress. Art, Article Three is the President of the United States. And so, so there's this tension and this push and pull. So because there's this actually this balance of power and check and balance in the United States, that you can go hard and you can you can elect a demagogue like Donald Trump who will beat drums and tell the Proud Boys to stand ready and stand by and say things that he did about immigrants and Muslims and Mexicans and shithole countries. He can he can get away with some of that stuff because you kind of know instinctively that there's going to be a counterbalance, you hope, in the Congress and a counterbalance in the Senate. And then there'll be the Supreme Court and then there'll be the states. Then, of course, there's the Bill of Rights. So, I mean, you have these counterbalancing pressures. In Canada, there's counterbalances, but it's not as hard as that in Canada, if you're elected the prime minister of Canada and you have a majority government, you control everything you control. And so the idea of electing somebody into that office who is unhinged or is on a ideological bender or is disruptive and will divide the country against itself in order to lead the bigger mass of people that they can animate, people see the inherent risk in that. Because they know that if you're on the winning side of that, that that pendulum will come back the other way. And then eventually that pendulum becomes a wrecking ball against the soul of the country. And that's not sustainable. And people have, a, have an instinct to just, I, I don't like that. I want my side to win, but I don't want to, I don't want to blow up my neighbor. I don't want to, I don't want to destroy, you know, I don't want to go to, to a, a PTA meeting with my son and not be able to even make eye contact with somebody across the room because they saw my party's lawn sign on my lawn. People are very instinctive against that because the power that's vested in the office of the Prime Minister of Canada is extraordinary, um, and 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 it's uh, it's 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 very um, very much recognized by most Canadians that you trust that power with somebody who's 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 thoughtful with it and whose temperament whose temperament is appropriately moderate. I think for the Americans watching, what you said about the American system. The presidency is the Article Two branch, the Supreme Court Article right. Three, but the Article One branch, the Capitol, uh, is the center of American life. Um, there is this moment in American history where George Washington, who could have been a king, this picture, this painting hangs in the in the Capitol. The throne chair is unoccupied. He's draped his military cloak over it. He won't be a Caesar, and he bows and subordinates himself to Congress as he resigns his commission. And one of the facets, the differences in the country culturally that I always think is interesting on the periphery and was reminded of in Prince Edward County in um, in Toronto last weekend, coming up the Loyalist Parkway. And, and you're on the Loyalist Parkway, and it was dedicated by the queen in 1984 and you and you read the history of it and this was the route that the pioneers came into prince edward county in the summer of 1784 uh fleeing 
the new United States. They were loyal to the king. And all these years later, um, many Americans don't appreciate this, but when Charles III succeeded his mother among his realms is Canada. He is the king of Canada. He is. He is our king. Um, but, you know, the, there's the king's representative in Canada, our governor general. But, you know, there's a, there's another part of that relationship. Now, of course, one in four Canadians lives in the province of Quebec. And their relationship with Westminster and the Crown, or sorry, Westminster, with Buckingham Palace and the Crown is is very different, of course, uh, than the rest of the country. So so we are a Commonwealth country. We're the, I think, the only country in the world that is a member of the Commonwealth, but we're also a member of the Francophonie. So we're, we are a diverse country from our founding through until today. And so those tensions and those balances, but from our founding of trying to balance French and English, Protestant and Catholic in the early days as well, which was also sort of code for French and English in, in a lot of parts of the country, um, as well as the indigenous dynamic, uh, you know, from the very beginning, trying to balance these tensions and helping folks get along and making accommodations for each other from, you know, from the, the third quarter of the 19th century all the way through until until today, modern Canada has served not only English and French speaking Canadians and Indigenous Canadians, I think, for the most part, but also for as we adopt and diversify and bring in folks from other parts of the world. So it served us well. There's, there's also, I think, a thing. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a strong monarchist in a lot of ways, but there's, there's a, there's a, there's a virtue thing about it, which is that the, the, the Royal family is a family. And so to have a family as the head of, of your, you know, the, the head of state is, is something that is, is there's, there's kind of a virtue in that, that at the end of the day, the, the family is an anchor, an anchor institution that doesn't go away, can never give up on each other, will always be supportive of each other, will always have each other's back. And there, there's a, there's sort of a virtue in that that's sort of unspoken that I think a lot of people have a little bit of a romantic notion about that, you know, politics can come and go, tensions can come and go, strife can come and go, crises can come and go, but at core and at backbone, we're a family. And the family never gives up on itself and never gives up on each other. And we always have each other's back. And so that's that the, there's kind of a, a strain of that that exists in the Commonwealth sentiment uh, amongst nations. Is the monarchy important in Canada today? Uh, not explicitly, not on a day to day basis. It's not as though, you know, in the nightly news, it's, you know, here's what happened in politics. Here's what's happening in the markets. You know, here's what's happening with our hockey teams. Oh, by the way, here's what here's the latest, uh, you know, missive about a Buckingham Palace. It's, it's not like that. Um, you know, we don't we don't obsess on the Meghan Markle side of things. But but, you know, but when there's a royal visit, it matters. It matters to communities. Um, and it matters to, uh, you know, the people who are, who are sort of, of of the generation who is sort of more connected with her majesty queen elizabeth and they are perhaps with charles um but it matters so we, we we keep an eye on what's happening in the uk brexit mattered to canada a lot as well our fifth largest trading partner is the uk uh, so the economic relationship the historic relationship the crown matters but not nearly as much as who the prime minister is because the the, the, the crown is never i think not in my lifetime has ever in any way flexed or threatened to flex or or to do anything that would in, in any way impede the independent operating of operation of the government of canada i, I want to come back to the organization of, of canadian society because i i think this is interesting and it's visibly evident if you if you land in a canadian airport and you go through uh, a customs line 40 million people 1 million people were admitted into canada in a calendar year that's an extraordinary amount of people how many will come this year unknown because part of the million was a was a COVID backlog that built up and, and brought in but the, but there's a goal and every year the government of canada all governments whether it's conservative or liberal they actually have to post what their goal is for a population growth and it used to be a big deal if you made two hundred fifty thousand new canadians per year the goal has sort of crept up over time when we were in government it was four hundred thousand. i think it'll probably settle in the 400 to five hundred thousand per year growth over time i mean we're we're well on our track to be a, a population of about 75 million people by 2050 um so that's you know more than tripling the size of the country that exists that, that when I was born and I'm 47. So like it's a, it's an exponential growth. Most of it, uh, most of those 
new Canadians reside in, in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, urban centers of the country. Calgary is growing as well. Um, so they, they become urbanized and all that, but the Balkanization does and can happen. You know, you have large South Asian community in the Vancouver area, large South Asian community in Surrey, uh, you know, Asian, uh, Mandarin and Cantonese speaking down in Richmond, and that can create some tensions locally as well. So the absorption of new Canadians is by most Canadians is seen as a, a, a shot in the arm of adrenaline of economic growth, people bringing in capital, bringing, people bringing in talents. It's not just family reunification for its own sake, but people coming here with skills, capacities, investment dollars, and, and brain power to invest into the Canadian family. So, so it's welcomed that way. But it's interesting that, you know, to your point, though, is that with that spike and that, and that consistent trend up of new Canadians, there is not a political party that has risen up to say, this is too much. We've got to close the door. We've got to turn it back. We've got to shut it down. We're getting, we need to, you know, in the Pat Buchanan language of 92, 96 of saying, we need to time out on immigration. We need to stop this because it's, they're, they're, you know, they're over, they're, you know, stressing our schools and overpopulating the emergency rooms and all that. Um, some people whisper about, you know, can we absorb this? Is it good? You know, we're not building enough houses for this. So therefore, we have, you know, a, a, a price inflation on, on housing that's disproportionate to income because we have too many people coming in. We can't build the houses. So there are tensions there, but it it never really tips over at all into a racial component or a blood and soil conversation or an us versus them. And you don't see the dog whistle politics and that, that you do see, frankly, in parts of the United States where there's an exploitative nature about it. Uh, you know, racial tensions exist, racists exist, intolerance exists. But for that to be seen as an opportunity politically, nobody does that. It just doesn't happen. It's it's pushed back against and rejected as soon as anybody even thinks of going down that road. When the and there's nothing, too, nothing too, by the way, a big difference between American and Canadian politics is that in America, because you have the open primary system, you, you declare yourself a Republican, you declare yourself a Democrat as a citizen if you want to, or an independent if you want to participate in in, uh, in primaries in different states, they have different rules. But in Canada, political parties are closed shops. You, you pay money, you have to be a citizen, you don't have to be a citizen, but you pay money to join the political party. You have to be a citizen to run for office, of course, but you have to join the party. But if, a, if you're a member of the party, just a rank and file member, you put down your, your 20 bucks, you join the party, then all of a sudden you go to your Facebook page and you put up a bunch of intolerant, racist, homophobic, or bigoted stuff against any group. The political party will turn around and say, no, no, your membership is canceled. You're out of here. We, we're, you are not you're not welcome in our club. You're not welcome in our group because even you as a member, not interested. And so that's why you have, you know, on January 6th or in Charlottesville, you have people who are, you know, the county chair of whatever member or whatever branch of the Republican Party showing up and marching with these, with these, you know, weirdos. And then that gets, and it creates a brand identity. It gets infected up into the party. Whereas in Canada, the leader of the party can throw you out of caucus, throw you out of the, the elected caucus. And so you have to, you're forced to sit as an independent. The party itself can throw people out of the party if they're expressing crazy and, and bizarre views on social media. So it, it, there's a, there's a, there's a, a check mechanism of accountability and, and and all that where the public will say, if you want to govern my country, you govern yourselves and show me what you've got. You've got this guy over here, that person gets exposed, they get thrown out. And so it creates demarcation lines of expectations and values that the public can very quickly audit. When How is Canada doing with regard to when we were kids would have been called the melting pot? the concept of assimilation, that no matter where you come from, that there is now a higher identity that binds you to everybody around you together, rooted to the place you're standing, which is Canada, right? When you arrive, you're on the beginning of this journey um, to become a Canadian. Um, how is Canada doing explaining to its new arrive, arrivees what it means to be Canadian, um, helping them with that journey. It's a needle that moves. And, and we had a lot of debate about this when Stephen Harper was prime minister. Um, you know, to, to your first question, of how are we doing with this sort of influx of diversity? I think we're doing very well. Uh, as I said, you don't see whether it's on the municipal level, provincial level, or federal level, you don't see an organized political party, you don't see some flamboyant or articulate personality trying to exploit divisions in Canada, it doesn't exist. So, so you know, 
politics is a reflection of society, not the other way around. If there's a market for that kind of stuff, it'll show up. There isn't a market for it. Um, and I think, and as I said earlier, it's because I think if you're a new Canadian, you're an ethnic minority, you you judge how you, you judge the system by how it treat, treats others. And, and therefore you can assume that the worst of what others are facing is the, what you might face. And so you create it, th those tensions exist. And so I think we've done a good job of sort of blowing through that. I think most people who come to Canada um, do have, I, I think, a lot of understanding and expectations of, of the Canadian system. Voter participation, by the way, amongst new Canadians is higher than it is amongst the second, third, and fourth generation of Canadians. People who come to Canada want to participate in our democracy, and they do. A lot of people who are landed, but they're not yet Canadian citizens, so they can vote in nominations, that which are primaries, but we call them nominations for candidates, and vote for leaders of the party. They get involved in party politics before they can vote in the general election campaign. When I was a candidate, you know, I had a lot of people who were volunteered in my campaign. They said, well, we can't vote in the election, but I sure want you to win. You know, let's go out and do some door knocking and hammer up some signs and, and meet some neighbors and talk to some people because, you know, I, I can't vote, but it matters to me. And so that that spirit of, of, of immigration inflow sort of contributing to the Canadian democracy, into the Canadian family is very common. And it crosses, by the way, whether you're uh, Chinese, Canadian, or, or you're from Hong Kong, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Europe, you know, wherever you're from, um, Canada is a very diverse and welcoming country. And it's also growing. But this, where, where I'm sitting right now, which would have been my district, when I was first elected back in 2000, 23 years ago, uh, this area was 80% Caucasian. Now it's it's about two thirds visible minority. Like the diversity is growing and changing constantly. I look at my son's classroom. My son is, is 10 turning 11 in a couple of weeks. You know, his classroom is as diverse as the community is. But I think it's important as well that not only that you welcome the diversity, but you host the diversity. And I think one of the things we've noticed as well is that you have to have diversity of of housing stock. If you just have big mansions and middle class homes, where we live, you, we have high rises and condos and townhouses and duplexes and detached homes. And so economic diversity also feeds ethnic diversity as well. Uh, and uh, we think it's good. It's healthy. I mean, I, I understand the instinct of a lot of people to want to feel more who, who might feel discomfort with the classroom where not everybody in the classroom speaks perfect English and can be friends with your kids. But over time, that's the world that they're going to go into. And so to have a classroom that's diverse where kids get to see other people of other of other differences, I think is a healthy thing. And it's by the way, it's not just ethnicity, right? Like my son has physical disabilities. And so to, to be to be with other kids who have disabilities is important. To have kids in the classroom who are on the spectrum is important. And you know, you know, often private schools or charter schools kind of isolate kids from people of different ethnic backgrounds or religious religious uh, um, teachings and physical differences. I, I think the more you break down those barriers, the more that we create a better bond between citizens and you create a better world through uh, through healthy citizenship. How worried are you? about the United States? Uh, at times, quite worried. Um, you know, in my time, and like you in politics, right? Like I, I want my team to win and I don't, and I don't want the other, the other side, to, but I always want the country to succeed. Um, never in my life, and again, I'm 47, never in my life, and I'm not even an American, have, has there been a politician where I just, my blood boils when I see them on television, that was Donald Trump. Um, as I said, I'm, I have a son with disabilities. And for me, the breakaway, like when he when he launched his campaign for president, um, you know, and he said, you know, we're going to we're going to stop Muslims from coming into the United States. I thought, well, that's it. He's he's done. That, that goes against all conventions and all everything. So he's it's over. And then when he mocked the New York Times reporter and his disabilities, for me, it became personal. I thought, oh, really? And then when, of course, when he won the the the, the presidency, I thought to myself, one day my son is going to say, how the hell did he say that? And then he became president. Like people did, he made fun of people who have disabilities. Like, and he he won. He became after that he won. But like, what is that? How how do you explain that? And <clears throat> so, so for me, you know, it was a bit personal. So and so when when America is divided against itself, um, that's very dangerous for the world. You see a rise of a belligerent and an imperial China in a lot of ways. If you think about intellectual property theft. The, the 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 grabbing up and the bribing away is the way to think about it the bribing away of of raw materials and resources across africa you see that imperial creep forward of, of china you see the belligerence of russia that doesn't happen um in, in a world where the united states is united and engaged and forward-leaning in the world i understand and the world does by the way to say to all my american friends 
we and the rest of the world, we do understand the exhaustion of America after 9-11 and the exhaustion of the Afghanistan war, the exhaustion of the Iraq war, the exhaustion of what's been burdened on the United States as a superpower in the expectation game, the spending on military relative to your G7 uh, and G20 partners when it, and, and NATO partners when it comes to military spend. We, I, I recognize that, and I think the vast majority of the world recognizes the exhaustion and the burden that's been, that, that has been shouldered in the United States. However, the United States retreating from the world is a dangerous thing for not just the world, but for the United States. Uh, what happens over there matters over here. Uh, when the rest of the world goes sideways, eventually that will come to America's shores. You cannot detach and just say, we will only focus on what we're doing. That's as absurd as, as somebody in, in Vermont saying, we will only focus on what happens in Vermont and it doesn't really matter what happens in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, and Maine. We will just going to focus on Vermont issues in Vermont. That doesn't work. It doesn't work within the United States. It doesn't work in the rest of the world. And so I, I you know, to your to your question, I, am I worried about the United States? I'm worried about a United States that becomes so internally divided, so neighbor versus neighbor that they can't that America can't come together, and the rest of the world therefore takes advantage of America's isolationism and detachment from the world. That is what I, I worry about what happens when America disengages because it's so internally divided. That makes the world a very dangerous place. I have a hypothetical question for you that I actually see coming down the lane. And I'm I'm wondering how you think Canadian society reacts to this. Let's imagine a scenario where Trump is reelected. Um and he's been quite explicit, and I have a policy which I'm quite clear about, is I take everything that everybody says literally and seriously. So when Donald Trump threatens to lock up political opponents, shut down media companies, um, is talking to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff about shooting people in the leg, I, I take all of this very seriously. What happens in Canada when the first prominent American asks for asylum from a political prosecution from the Trump administration in Canada with with merit? That would be very interesting. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it would depend on the instance and the circumstance. Uh, there, uh, there would not likely be an agreement on the surface. But it would depend on who's in government in Canada. Uh, in Canada, we're not expected to have an election probably until 2025. And I think Justin Trudeau, as I said earlier, one of the it's it's sort of the hail mary pass of what he's he could if he decides he's going to run again, he would be banking on Donald Trump coming back, Donald Trump being crazy, Donald Trump being belligerent and offensive, and therefore exploiting that in 2000. And so when Donald Trump ran in 2016. Justin Trudeau is a fresh new prime minister, and he we just kind of stayed away from American politics as we instinctively do. And to, in the 2020 campaign, you know, we had just come out of, and we were just having the ink dry on the new Canada-US NAFTA agreement. And so picking a fight with an incumbent president who might beat Joe Biden is probably not great, especially also when we we're trying to get access to PPE and vaccines from the United States. Like this was this was a, a life, not just an important economic relationship, but a life and death relationship, Canada, the United States. You probably don't want to pick a fight with Donald Trump and exploit, you know, the unpopularity of Donald Trump in Canada when the guy could get reelected and block vaccines from coming into Canada. So it was a tactical thing. Gloves are off. Now, when you have Justin Trudeau going for a fourth mandate, he's desperate. He's he's way back in the polls to draw and drag and to pick a fight with Donald Trump so that he can get Pierre Polyev to be aligned with him um, in, a, in a dynamic like that. I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he would look for somebody who would try to say that, you know, their human rights are being abused. And then Justin Trudeau would welcome somebody into Canada, hold them up as a as a sort of a poster child of how how compassionate he is uh, versus Donald Trump. And of course, that would be you know, toxic for Canada and the Canada-US relationship. But for Justin Trudeau to stay in power, there's a further left-wing party, the socialist NDP, they would love all this. And so it would, it, but again, all of this is bad. All of it is bad because it just spirals out of control. The Canada-US relationship is the most successful economic partnership and security relationship in the history of the world. The platform, the North American platform of job creation, wealth creation, the the use of the effective in, in integration of supply chains and, and resources for our prosperity and benefit is unmatched in human history. 
And if it breaks and cracks because Justin Trudeau is desperate for a fourth term or because Donald Trump wants to exploit a minority community or stay into power because his psychopathy, psychopathy is such that he can't even imagine the world, a world without him, that he's not only narcissistic, but nihilistic to, to that degree. And then you have Lopez Obrador in Mexico, um, you know, welcoming in China and threatening the NAFTA relationship. If, if domestic politics and exploitation of division and desperation to stay in power, whether it's Trump or Trudeau or anybody else, gets to the point where they crack this North American platform, which should be sacrosanct for the well-being of our continent and all of us, then shame on all of us if we tolerate politicians who do that. Last question for you, because you have alluded to something that is true, but not talked about often enough. Justin Trudeau wants Donald Trump back in the White House because it's good to because it's good for Justin Trudeau in the same way that President Biden wants Trump as the Republican nominee because they assess Trump incorrectly, I believe as an easy foe to beat. So my question for you is, what is Trump? Is Trump a real threat or is he just a great prop? And when you look at the American election ahead, how do you see it? Is it an election between democracy and autocracy, which is how I see it? Or is it an election between the ambition of two guys and it basically hues to a line somewhere in the middle on automatic pilot, no matter what, because I reject that worldview. I think it's the, well, I think it's the, the, the former, uh, I think it is, it is a, you know, like elections are about choosing the values that will, that, that will, you know, forever stand the test of time and demonstrate the modern era for eternity and to tolerate um, that, you know, to tolerate Donald Trump as president of the United States, after everything that we've seen, after everything that's gone through, after everything that's happened, uh, the division, the the ugliness, the just you, you go down the you go down the rabbit hole of all the stuff, and you know you have so so effectively for years now. Um, it's it's just to me, it's unimaginable. Like, it's unimaginable. I don't get it. You know, it's like I, I was in Cleveland in 2016 when Donald Trump won the nomination. I was uh, there doing political analysis for a Canadian uh, television network. And I just remember watching and I walking around the concourse in in the arena there in Cleveland and talking to people with the red MAGA hats on and just sort of like like John, like your own governor, John Kasich, is not even there. Like how, like the, the the Bushes and the McCains and the Rom, like no, none of them are there. Like he's really going to build a wall. And, and like talking to people who believe in this stuff, it was, as I say, it's like talking to people who think professional wrestling is real. It's like you don't do you not see this charade? Do you not see that he's just a grifter? He's not a successful businessman. He's gone bankrupt. Like there's nothing about this guy that he's not about you. You know, you got the Oliver Anthony song, right? Rich men north of Richmond. Who is Donald Trump? It's like the people who love that song or what like this. It's it's all this bizarre charade of contradiction and hypocrisy and ugliness and cruelty and and ridiculousness and now corruption with 91 felony charges and, and four indictments in four different jurisdictions. Like what this it's just bizarro world that he's even contemplated as a credible candidate for president of the United States. And so the, the the game of chicken that some people play of saying, well, Joe Biden, like <clears throat> as you get into your sunset years, the 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 escalation of the of the health risks is 10x year by year. Like it gets more and more and more dangerous. And you know, 2024 and the and the aggressiveness of the campaign that's starting now and will go through for the next, you know, for, for the next year is going to be grueling and vicious and brutal. And Joe Biden and his presentation, I think, is is such that it absolutely hastens the possibility that Donald Trump will be president of the United States again. And I think the rest in Canada, we just see this as bizarre that these are the choices. These are the choices. Not, not that Joe Biden isn't a, a decent and honorable and good man who's 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 done a lot of things as president that one can agree or disagree with. But it's just this this seniority grip that exists on American politics that 
you know, like how does Newt Gingrich become Speaker of the House? Because he's from, at that time, one of the safest, was Georgia's fifth or sixth district, which at that time was one of the reddest districts. So he just endures, he, he climbs up the ladder of leadership. And then you have Nancy Pelosi in San Francisco. So just by, by virtue of seniority and duration over time, you just kind of spiral up the ladder of leadership and you take over and you own these political parties. And Joe Biden and Donald Trump now, because of the cult of Trump, it's just kind of bizarre that, this great democracy doesn't spit out great democratic choices that, you know, the, the, the churn is not there of new talent coming in. It seems to happen on the state state level, seems to happen on the, on the city level, but the churn at the national level is, doesn't seem to be there in a way that gives people a sense of uh, fresh renewal on the national level. And I think that's, that's very disconcerting. Perfect place to leave it. Minister James Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you never miss a video. Also, for more content just like this, please consider joining our Warning Premium community. You can find out more in the description below.